A very good morning to you all. A very warm welcome to you and a, and a very, very happy Christmas to one and all this morning. Especially a very warm welcome if you are visiting us. Um, I hope and pray that you'll be blessed through our time together as we worship and we spend time rejoicing in the amazing and wonderful news of Christmas. At Christmas we remember God came to earth in his son. He came to rescue us, to rescue us out of our hopelessness and our helplessness, to bring us forgiveness for sin and to bring us into right relationship with God and to bring life. So let's begin our service this morning as we light our final Advent candle. I'll ask the, uh, the Griffiths if they'd like to come up and, and, and lead us in that. Hello. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Today we light again the candles of hope, peace, love and joy. We speak the first candle, we speak of hope because God keeps his promises to us. Uh, the second candle, we work for peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he calls his children to work for peace in his name. The third candle, we show love because Jesus gave everything for us and led us to know the forgiveness of God. The fourth candle, we share joy because the Holy Spirit fills our hearts and our minds with the presence of God. And now we light our last candle to remember the birth of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. As the prophets promised so long ago, you have come to us once again. And with the shepherds, we are filled with wonder and amazement. When Jesus spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray together, shall we? <laughs> Lord Jesus, you came as a tiny, fragile baby. Yet we know that you are God and you are with us. May the flame of this candle remind us that you are the light of the world. And that if we follow you, we will never walk in darkness, but have the true light of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. That's brilliant. It's a good job you had three children. You... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, let's encourage each other this morning as we stand, and we're going to encourage each other by saying, Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Let's stand and sing our first hymn.
Do please this evening. Well, hello again. We've been having an Advent series, children's talks. Uh, well, we've been having uh, family talks all the way since September on big words. Big words. What we thought we'd do this morning was something a little bit different and we'd have big presents. So has anyone brought a present that they would like to show everybody else? Just while you're, I mean, if you want to come, just come to the front. You don't, it doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. I'll show you mine. Show you the sort of quality thing that we're thinking about. Uh, stick and style bangles. And create five cool bangles with 262 colourful tickets. We thought we'd try and start a new tradition in this, this year in our family. It's not going to be a tradition, it's cancelled from now on. <laughs> the tradition was you're allowed to spend £2 on each other and see what you can get. And I ended up with two of these, so it's not going to be... <laughs> it's not going to be a tradition that we continue, it's really not. Uh, it's something that we tried and obviously failed, so... but. Has anyone got anything better than that? Has anyone got anything better? Has anyone got anything this morning? They've opened something and they want to come. Penelope's got something. <laughs> what have you got, Penelope? What have you got? What have you got? Is that a Muppet? It's Does it tickle me Elmo. It's a what? Yeah. Tickle me Elmo. Tickle me Elmo? Does it make a noise when we tickle him? Is that right? Is it... Yeah, well, very good. Yeah, fantastic. Well done, Penelope. That's great, that is. That's great. If you was a little bit older, I would have given you one of these as well, but... Three plus years, it says on the box, so we better not. No, we better not. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Anybody else? Anybody else got anything you want to come and show us? Someone must have something. I've got a new jumper. I thought I'd put that on this morning. It's nice, isn't it? Go on, Dan. You can tell you're itching to get up here, mate. You can tell you're itching to get up here and show us what it is. Oh, what have we got? Christmas story advent calendar dot to dot. Fantastic. That's a good idea, isn't it? Look at all that. You've done half of them already. <laughs> well done. Wow. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for coming and sharing that. Brilliant. Thank you. Anybody else got anything? Come on, Dan. Come on, Dan. You know you want to. You know you want to. Mystery box. Bring your mum up, Dan. Well done. Well done. Happy birthday to Nancy this morning. Happy birthday, Nancy. I've got yeah. two, actually. All right, let's, uh, let's figure out what you've got. You've got two, OK, so... Oh, wow, what's that? You broke your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a glove with... I don't know. Mine, okay. mine was broken, actually. OK, no, that's good. That's good, I like that, yeah. You see where you are at night, get your keys in the door. The yeah, <laughs> no, you've got a mystery box. <laughs> well done, mate. Thank you for coming up and sharing that. That's brilliant. Fantastic. Okay. Right, okay. Is there any, any girls in, older than three but younger than ten, that want one of these? <laughs> Anybody, any, any girls in that want one of these? Seriously, you can have it. It's a Christmas present. I'll, I'll, you'll have hours of fun with it. No, I'm going to have to bring the finished article one week out and show you it. Okay, no, you don't want that. Okay, anything else? Any other presents? Anything that anyone else has got? Charlie has. Charlie, where's Charlie? Where are you, Charlie? Tidy. Tidy. Do you want to show us? You don't have to if you don't want to. Do you want to? No, come to the front. Go on in. Well done, Charlie. Well done. Let's have a look what you've got. What have you got? Oh, wow. Say that loud. Pandora bracelet. Let's have a look. Let's have a quick look. What have you got on it? Is that a soldier? And what's that one? You know what that is? No? <coughs> Different things on it though. Looking good, looking good, well done. Yeah, one more. One more. We're going to have to do a bit of work here. I couldn't stop people at Stapleford. They were always coming forward and a little bit more hesitant here this morning. Is that, are we filming it today? <laughs> yeah. That's it. Have we got anyone else? So, so we're holding things up at the back. Can you not get out? Is that you, Joy? Brill, thank you, Joy. <laughs> Is that right? You got socks, villain? 
Yeah, look at them. They're fantastic, aren't they? They're great, they are. They look like they've got the Easter story on. Is that right? Is that the cross? Yeah. Easter socks at Christmas. That's a good idea. <laughs> the two go together, don't they? They have to go together. Christmas and Easter. What have we got here? What have we got? We've got, a, we've got a little puppy in a, in a dog box. A little puppy in a dog box. All right. Has the puppy got a name? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. He said, that's my seat. I want to go back and sit in it. Are you going... Is that all right? Go s- okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> Don't worry. You go and sit in your seat. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. Well, you know, the Bible says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And the reason I think we give gifts at Christmas is so we can remember the biggest gift that was ever given, which is, of course, the Lord Jesus, isn't it? So let's pray, shall we, and thank God for his greatest gift to us. Lord, we thank you so much as we give these gifts, these small tokens to each other or even bigger things to each other to express our our love for each other and to show people that we care. We thank you that you've done that on a massive scale. You've sent the best thing that you had, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world. And he is indescribable. And we try and and we think we know elements of him and we know bits about him. But the depth of who he is of what he's done for us, we will be thinking about for eternity. And we do thank you, Lord, for all the gifts that we've got today. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for that indescribable gift. And we pray that we may honour him today. We may know him in our hearts, in our lives. We may love him and we may serve him. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Thank you. We're going to sing. We're going to stand up. We're going to sing. It's one that gets us going. Come and join the celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Let's uh, spend some time just praying to our loving Father God. We, Father, we thank you today that today is a day of celebration and jubilation. We celebrate and give thanks that in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, a new king was born, the perfect king, the king of kings, the king who rules and reigns, born not in a palace or in riches, and in splendor, but in a borrowed manger and in poverty. A king who reigns over all the earth, but a king who is a perfect servant. We celebrate and give thanks that Jesus came, the Son of God, all of the fullness and the glory and majesty and power of God, veiled in a helpless and tiny baby. The word that made and sustains the whole universe became a helpless baby. 
We celebrate and give thanks that Christmas shows that God is with us. God, you are not far off or distant, but you came to save and rescue us and to reveal in human flesh the depth of your love towards us, to provide a way of salvation, to restore our broken relationship with you. Like the wise men who came from afar to give gifts, we want to give you our worship and thanks this Christmas day. We know sometimes that can be really hard because so many things try and get our attention and our affections in this season. We want to keep you at the center of everything we do this day and this Christmas season. We're sorry when we don't do that and we pray that you would help us, please, to not get so distracted and drawn after different things to keep you at the center. We thank you that Christmas reveals that you are with us. You will never leave us or forsake us. We pray that around this world, this Christmas time, this message would ring and be shown and proclaimed into people's lives, that they might receive you as their king through faith and trust in Jesus. Father, we want to lift in prayer to you those who today will be apart from family and friends as they work in essential services. We pray that you would sustain and bless and help them in their roles and their responsibilities. We thank you for all that they are doing to serve and to help others. We pray that you would bless them at this time. We also recognise that amidst much joy and celebration, Christmas can be a really difficult time for people. We think of people in situations of conflict and war. We think of people who are lonely because they have lost loved ones or because of relationship breakdown. We think of people who are going through difficult struggles with health problems, with money worries, with anxieties for the future and fears. Father, we pray that you would give peace you bring comfort, Father, that you bring hope, you bring joy in the midst of even the most difficult and trying of situations. We pray that whatever situation they're in, that they would rejoice in knowing that you love them and they can put their trust in you. We pray for all of these things in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> So let's stand and sing our next song of worship this morning, which was Joy to the World, and then Katrina will come and read God's word to us. Thank you.
This morning's reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. It's entitled, For to us a child is born. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he had made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice because you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. Hello again. <laughs> Third time we've come up here. I love this passage, don't you? You know, I like that bit. I, I, I didn't used to like it. That bit when it sort of goes off on one a bit and you were talking about uh, people celebrating after war and things like that. You know, you think, oh, that's a bit messy. I just want to get to the, towards the child is born. But the reality is, of course, the child was born into a messy, mixed up, crazy, mad, bad, sinful, rebellious world. That's the reality, isn't it? You know, if you really want to understand something of what the light is in this passage, then you need to understand something of the darkness, don't you? And the end of chapter 8 talks about how dark it really is. How dark the world is. What is the answer to that? Well, the answer is light. Of course it's light. But what does that look like? Well, it looks like a son. It's a child born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. It's incredible, isn't it? How does that light shine? Well, that's what I want to think about this morning. I want to think about some of those words that Isaiah used. Just two, really. Wonderful counsellor. Wonderful counsellor. I want to think about that. But first, I want to set the scene. Because I just think we need to think a little bit about what Isaiah's doing here. Because you may hear those words and think, well, yeah, maybe. Wonderful counsellor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hmm, maybe. Why would we think that with such incredible words, such amazing words? Why would we think, well, maybe. I'll tell you why. This is my understanding of it. We live in a world that over-promises and under-delivers. So we see things that promise something, but we always think, yeah, maybe. Because we know... We've bought things that thought did one thing and then it turns out they didn't quite do what we thought they were going to do. We've been disappointed, haven't we? Maybe you've been disappointed this morning. I mean, if you didn't get a bangle set like me, I'm sure you were disappointed. <laughs> Maybe you've been disappointed this morning. I mean, it's what happens. The, the world is screaming at us. And if, you know, I'm not blaming the advertising people. I think if, you know, you've got to try and make a noise in a loud world, then you, you promise something, don't you? Yeah, in a sense, that's what you do. I mean, let's take broadband, for example. You know, you see the big thing, you know, get this broadband. It's the fastest thing you'll ever get. They draw us in, don't they, with words like mega and fiber. And we're like, oh, wow, that sounds good. Don't know what it means, but I mean, that, you know, that's what we, you know, have you got fiber broadband? No, oh, well, you're not in the 21st century. It's incredible, isn't it? You've got this big thing. It shows you the, 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 the longest deal on the shortest price. And then it has that very small word, from. So you think you're going to be paying $19.99 a month, but if you really want everything it offers in the thing, you're probably spending more like $99.99 a month. And then we've got something that covers all of this, haven't we? The reason we can get away with over-promising and under-delivering is because we've got something that covers it all, and it's called the small print. 
So you read the small print, or you look at your deal, and you think, for 19.99 a month, I'm going to get this broadband, and it says, only possible in 1% of areas for 1% of the time, best broadband speeds between 1.30 and 3.30 a.m. <laughs> now, I exaggerate to make a point, obviously, but you know what I'm talking about. We live in a world that over-promises and under-delivers. So often we're disappointed. Often we don't think we get what we're going to get. So we see a passage like this, and we think, well, that's what Isaiah's doing. Isaiah has given us the large print and we need to see the small print. And we can think like that without even knowing it, unconsciously. We can think like that when it comes to Jesus. Is he a wonderful counsellor? Is he really? What is Isaiah doing here? Well, let's have a think about that, shall we? He's writing just before the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's looking to the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah which will be the lowest point in Israel's history, that the people of God will go into exile in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. They will be there. But what Isaiah is trying to do is to look beyond that, to help people to see that when people have grasped and seen that things are really bad, that this world isn't how it's supposed to be, when people have have understood and tasted some of that disappointment, That's when they can turn to God, and he will not disappoint. And this is what he says. He says that there will be a son. There will be someone who offers hope in the difficulty. Isaiah offers hope that one day God will act in such a decisive way that people will definitely know about it. That's what he promises. He will send someone. And he's not going over the top in his expectation when he says he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Huge titles, aren't they? Huge titles. And and we haven't got time to look at them all this morning. We've got many Christmases together, I hope, so we'll look at different ones over different years. I'm sure the turkey's in the oven. So I just want to look at that first one. When we're thinking of this question... Does Isaiah overpromise and underdeliver? Or you could say, does God through Isaiah overpromise and underdeliver when it comes to Jesus with calling him a wonderful counselor? Well, let's think about it, shall we? A counselor is somebody who gives counsel. They use words, don't they? They tell you something and they want you to understand it and they want you to apply it to your life. That's the point. You can go to a counselor. And you can completely ignore them, and it will have been a complete waste of money. The whole point of going to a counsellor is to listen to what they say. They try and listen to you first, for what your issue is, what your problem is, and then they explain it to you. So it's somebody who gives counsel, who then that counsel needs to be taken on board and obeyed. The places that Jesus gives counsel mainly are in the Gospels, aren't they? We see that this baby grows up. We don't know that much about him as a baby, but we know loads about him as an adult loads about him and and he says so many different things he gives so much counsel i mean i can't fit it all into a 10 minute talk here this morning but here's a few snippets and you know maybe you won't even mention your favorite because the gospels are full of the things that jesus says he counsels a paralytic saying to him your sins are forgiven and everyone in the room is thinking well where did that come from This bloke can't walk and he's talking about sin. Jesus gets straight to the inside. He says, your sins are forgiven. He counsels a demoniac who he has just delivered to say, take this good news to the people that you know. He counsels a dead man to come out of the grave. Three words, Lazarus, come out. And he does. He counsels the disciples about his looming death and resurrection and they haven't got a clue. They will not listen to him. They do not have a framework for fitting into it the fact that this person, this incredible person they know and love and follow will have to die and be raised to life again. I mean, who would? You can't blame them, can you? Who would? That's what the world still struggles with, isn't it? He counsels the thief on the cross. This is wonderful, isn't it? Today you will be with me in paradise. I love that one. Fantastic. He counsels the woman at the well to ask for living water. You know, you imagine, when you see that 
that interlude, that exchange, not interlude, that exchange between Jesus and the woman at the well. And he says, you know, if only you knew who it was that was asking you for water, you would ask him for living water. And we're all thinking, yeah, that's Jesus. He's the one that can give living water. He counsels the weary and the heavy burden to come to him and learn from him. He gives counsel to us about the most important things in life, in telling us how to be blessed, what to live for, what not to live for, things that will get us into trouble, things that will please God. He counsels us to turn to our Heavenly Father in prayer. He counsels us to seek His kingdom and His righteousness. He counsels us to share what we know with others. He counsels us to overcome evil with good. He counsels us about how to deal with money and anxiety and worry and fear. He counsels us how to behave in the right way with regard to our sex lives. He talks about things that are important to us. Do you understand? His counsel is not just out there somewhere and doesn't mean anything. He talks about the things that are incredibly important to us. He counsels how to relate to others, whether that's friends or enemies. Love your enemies, he says, and pray for those who persecute you. He counsels us with regard to all these things in the light of our relationship with him. Doesn't he? We can know him. I know him. <laughs> Santa's coming. I know him. Jesus is coming. I know him. Isn't that what we need first and foremost? A relationship with this Jesus who then tells us what to do in a loving, gracious way. Because you see, he helps us to see who he really is. Without shouting. Without pushing. But gently persuading. Leading. Showing, dying, and now living. That's how he does it. I think, based on those few snippets, it's fair to say he is a wonderful counsellor. When I see those words in Isaiah 9, 6, my heart leaps for joy, because I know something of the truth. You know, in Josh McDowell's book, More Than a Carpenter, which he wrote uh, many years ago now, in it, he talks about a student at California at university. And he says this, he says, his psychology professor had said in class, this is a normal everyday psychology class, that all he has to do is pick up his Bible and read portions of Christ's teaching to many of his patients, and that's all the counselling they need. And that may seem a little bit simplistic to some of you, but the reason for that is not because it's not true, it's because we don't really believe it. We don't really listen to it. There's no deficiency in the council. The deficiency comes in our listening to it and obeying it. Why can Jesus be such a wonderful counsellor? I'll tell you why. Because he designed you. He designed you. He knows exactly what you're like. He knows what we're like as humans because he's the one that put us together in the first place. All things were created through him. That's incredible, isn't it? I don't know if you watch films at Christmas, as you know, Mary Poppins might be on, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Um, uh, you know, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, or, you know, all the classics, Dan Busters, the old Dan Busters film. That, I don't know if that's on this year or not. There's a great line in that film. I love it. Barnes Wallace is struggling. He's trying to get this bomb off the ground. Well, he's trying to get it off the ground a few times because it's a bouncing bomb. So he's, he wants it to be dropped and then he wants it to go, go, go and then, and then fall down. And, and he, he hasn't got any aircraft that's big enough and he goes to see his military contact and he says to them, he says, I think we need a Wellington. That's a massive bomber. I think we need a Wellington. And, and the military contact sort of goes, oh, oh, you know, you know, you can tell he's thinking you've got no chance, mate. You know, there's a war on, and you want me to get you a massive aeroplane? He says, oh, I don't think it's going to be possible to get a Wellington bomber. And Barn Wallace, Barnes Wallace turns around and he says, will it help if you tell them I designed it? Cut to the next scene, there's a Wellington bomber flying over and a bouncing bomb coming out. Of course it helps that he designed it. Jesus designed us. The reason he's such a wonderful counsellor is because he knows what we need. He knows us. He knows us intimately. And when he's giving advice, it's not because he wants us to live boring lives. It's not because he wants us just to be different. It's because he loves us and he cares for us. And his grace for us is so strong that what he does is he takes on flesh himself. He comes into one of these human bodies, fully human, 
and yet at the same time still fully God. Get your head around that, can't do it. But that's the reality. And he walks around and he counsels people and he talks to them and he shares with them about the important things in life, the things that are important to us. It turns out, doesn't it, what we've got in Isaiah is the small print. It's not the big print. It's not over-promising. It's just giving us a little snippet of the reality of what's coming up. The big print is in the Gospels. Bang! Whoa! Read them. Find out more about Jesus if you haven't done it before. Just read the Gospels thinking, what does he tell me about me and about my situation? Because you might think it's old and it belongs to a different time. And I tell you, you'll be blown away when you start to see how Jesus understands you and knows you. In the Gospels, we have the bigger print. And this is the challenge this morning. This has got to be the challenge to us when we think about these two words, doesn't it? Wonderful counsellor. Is he our wonderful counsellor? Is he my wonderful counsellor? Do you listen to him? Do you live your life based on the counsel that Jesus gives? It's worth trying, isn't it? Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, we do thank you for these two incredible words that when we just start to think about them and ponder on them and see where they lead and see who they're about, and see that reality of a man that walked in a dark world, shining his light, that God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, going around, meeting people's needs, talking to them, saying things that surprise them, meeting them in their own situation, in their own need, and helping people to turn to him. We thank you, Lord, that we can say this morning, and certainly I can say it from my own experience, that Jesus is a wonderful counsellor. Help us, Lord, we pray, to listen to him, to follow his counsel, and to trust you, we pray. In his name we ask. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, to follow that, we're going to sing our final song, uh, which is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand together, shall we? <laughs>
you. Well done, everybody. That sounded fantastic. Brilliant. Um, next Sunday, we're meeting again. If you've enjoyed it this morning, you want to come back. If you're a visitor, love to see you. We're meeting at 10.30 next week. It's a communion service. It's a joint service. So uh, please do come to that. Love to see you again. And uh, I think the final thing for me to say to you is Merry Christmas. God bless. <laughs> Thank you.